All right. A Theology of Public Life, Lessons for Lot in the City of Sodom. Uh, separation of church and state this morning. Uh, last week, as we get into our subject this morning now, continuing to build on what we started a couple of weeks ago um, with specific respect to the overreach of government now. We want to talk uh, or introduce, and it's just a brief introduction. All of these things are introductions. So even though we spend uh, an hour each week talking about these things, they really are just brief overviews of um, subjects, topics that... Um, require much, much more study for all of us if we're going to be fully versed on these things. And so, but I hope that a brief introduction, at least during the class in Sunday school, will help you uh, as we move forward in considering and thinking about these things. And as we cultivate in the years to come, a good, healthy, biblical theology of public life. So last week we introduced the, the biblical concept, the biblical concept of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a, a biblical concept. That's uh, from two words, juris meaning law and diction meaning to speak. And it is the authority that is delegated by God within certain spheres to speak the law, the authority that God gives to speak the law. That authority to speak the law, uh, that jurisdiction, is bounded or fenced as determined by God's word. God's word gives us a proper jurisdiction or proper authority to speak the law uh, within certain spheres or bounds. For example, the individual has jurisdiction. In other words, the individual has jurisdiction over their own conscience, authority over his own conscience. No one can compel or should compel the conscience of the individual. The family has jurisdiction. A husband over his wife, parents over their children. The state has jurisdiction. God's minister over the people for good. The state should be restraining evil. And then the church has jurisdiction as well. Uh, the church may not usurp the authority or encroach upon the jurisdiction of a father, for example, and the state may not usurp the authority or encroach upon the jurisdiction of the church. Neither may compel the conscience of the individual, and each has been given a bounded authority or specific jurisdiction. One, however, has been given all authority. Who's that? Jesus Christ. That's right. One, only one, may dictate to all and may dictate and compel the conscience, heart, mind of the individual. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one from whom all authority is derived or the one who delegates all authority. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the Lord Jesus Christ says that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. His authority is the only authority that is unbounded, right? Um, has jurisdiction over all of those spheres simultaneously. All other authority, including and particularly the authority of the state, is a derived or a delegated authority. It's bounded and not just bounded by men or conventions of men, constitutions. It's bounded specifically by God's word. All authority is governed or bounded by God's word, what God says in his word. For all others exercising a delegated authority then, the arbitrary, unrestrained, or abusive exercise of that authority is what we refer to as tyranny. And we talked about that term uh, some last week. We defined it as the uh, unrestrained, the arbitrary, unrestrained, or abusive exercise of authority. Tyranny is defined as the arbitrary, unrestrained, or abusive exercise of authority or power. It's arbitrary, meaning without reference to biblical law. It's unrestrained without reference to biblical limitations, and it is abusive without reference to biblical love. Think about those three terms for a moment. I think that well defines tyranny as it relates to God's word. It's arbitrary. The exercise of power being arbitrary is without reference to biblical law. Can someone think with me for a moment and give me an example of what that might look like? What would be the arbitrary exercise of power in that it isn't or it, without reference to biblical law? What might that look like? John. When a parent tells you to do something, quote, because I said so. <laughs> okay. it's very good. I think because I said so is somewhere in the Bible. I'm pretty sure that's right. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. It's got to be in there. Yeah, because I said so. Anya? Because I said so. 
it, it, one more time, justice was... Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see that, right? This, um, this um, exercise of law without reference to biblical law or the arbitrary application of law. We see that in the, in the practice of the Pharisees, don't we? Um, adding to God's word. Noel, go ahead. If I understand the question correctly, are you asking for an example in our particular context? Uh, could be, yeah, okay. any context. So I know that one of the big ones is going to be in our day, and it's been going on for some time, but, you know, abortion. So the Lord Very hates good. hands, you know, Proverbs 6 says that the Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. Yeah. And really it's murder. They call it abortion, but it's murder is an example of that where it's sanctioned by the state. Very good. Sanctioned by the state, not sanctioned by God's word, right? In other words, that's an arbitrary uh, exercise of power uh, in the sense that it's power exercised without respect to God's law, right? Very good. Okay, those are good examples. Uh, think with me about the unrestrained exercise of power, uh, power ex exercised without reference to biblical limitations, biblical limitations. What might that look like? Anyone think of an example? Yeah, Sergio. Definitely tyranny. <laughs> There's no question about that. The quintessential example <laughs> example of tyranny. Yeah, thank you, brother. Yes, Jesse. We have we have a guy walking around with a microphone. Okay. So Good. Good deal. So We're getting the answers too quick. So. Yeah. You have to run, Lee. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Danny. Communism. Yeah, without um, reference to biblical limitations. Yeah, the worship of the state. Very good. Yeah, Sixto. <laughs> Lee saunters up the aisle. Uh, the arbitrary uh, closing down of churches and like the pest coats when he got put in jail. And yeah, very then good. when he got out, uh, he went back to teach and they fenced off his church so they couldn't meet yeah. there. Yeah. And they claim, don't they, warrant from the Constitution or warrant from law to do those things. Um, but that's uh, law without limitation. That's authority without limitation, certainly without biblical, without reference to biblical limitations. And so that unrestrained wielding or exercising of power is an example of tyranny. Those are good examples, okay? And then lastly, abusive. Um, we can think of all kinds of examples with respect to an abusive exercise of power. Uh, can't we? Um, when a, a husband is authoritarian uh, over his wife or when uh, a wife is the drippy faucet to her husband <laughs> or uh, right uh, inside the home or uh, when mom and dad are um, authoritarian in their exercise of discipline with the kids. Uh, these are, uh, there are ways in which um, power can be exercised without respect to love. We see that on the, on the part of, of governments on a regular basis, right? That's one of the boundaries um, within which uh, power is to be exercised within the bounds of love. So, uh, for example, in a Christian marriage, uh, there are certain things that a husband might imagine that he has the authority to do within the bounds of his own marriage as head of his household. But when the husband applies the law of love, to what he's thinking might otherwise change what he intended. Um, love governs or sets boundaries on the exercise of a husband's authority. Uh, the same boundary exists for governments that are uh, to operate according to God's uh, authority or according to God's law. They should be operating according to the common good, what's good for the people and not what's uh, evil for the people. So when governments pass laws uh, that are, like we have in our country now, passing laws that are harmful or detrimental, in particular to Christians, uh, we can think of several of those, right, with respect to gay marriage and uh, just a perpetual series of lawsuits against a baker who doesn't want to bake a cake, right, those, those kinds of things. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we can think of that, those, those, the arbitrary exercise of authority that's not... Um, within the bounds of what the Bible would say is uh, good for the population within the bounds of biblical love. Okay.
So tyranny is defined as the arbitrary, unrestrained, or abusive exercise of authority. Circumventing biblical law or biblical limitations, uh, circumventing biblical love, and a man can be a tyrant in his home, a pastor can be a tyrant in the church, a government can be tyrann tyrannical over the state. Uh, if you've ever, for example, uh, visited or waited in a two-hour line for a ride at Disney in July, then you've witnessed, uh, very likely witnessed, uh, the tyrannical exercise of authority that a two-year-old might have over his family, right? <laughs> Standing in line for a ride at Disney. Uh, he's wielding a tyrannical influence over the household that's not his uh, to wield, a power that's not his to wield. Um, it's no less unseemly when one of our political parties does the same thing, right? No less uh, distasteful or uh, uh, sinful when one of our political parties does the exact same things. In other words, those issues of jurisdiction, operating within the proper bounds of biblical law, biblical limitations, biblical love, um, that applies to all spheres of authority, uh, not just a husband in his home, not just a pastor in the church, but also to the state, right? Unless a tyrant repents of that tyranny, that tyrant has forfeited his authority and has lost the consent by which he leads. He is not to be obeyed in his tyranny. And we're going to unpack that statement in detail in coming weeks, because that's a loaded statement. But unless a tyrant repents of his tyranny, he has forfeited his authority. He's lost or forfeited the consent by which he leads, the biblical consent by which he leads. Now we're going to talk about what that looks like, why that is, as we work through some texts. Um, stay tuned for that. Our rights are given to us by God, and we enjoy a blessed freedom under his rule. In other words, uh, we don't gain favor or gain our rights from the state. Our rights are inalienable rights given to us by God, uh, not given to us by the state, and those rights are not to be taken away. Tyranny is the satanic counterfeit to God-ordained and God-given authority. When God instituted government, when God instituted marriage, when God instituted the family, um, when God instituted the church, God instituted those authorities to operate within biblical parameters, within biblical limitations, within biblical law, according to biblical love, uh, and they're to operate according to his word, not autonomously separate from his word or outside the bounds of his word. And so when a state, a family, a church operates outside the bounds of biblical law, uh, that state, family, or church becomes uh, tyrannical in their uh, authority. Tyranny seeks to usurp that authority. Tyranny seeks to steal it, as it were, uh, oppress its freedom. And that tyranny is the history of fallen man. We see examples of tyranny in that way uh, all over the place in the Bible. Uh, Adam, at the fall, took upon himself an authority that did not belong to him when he ate of the tree in the garden. Adam took upon himself an authority that did not belong to him. Lamech, you remember these stories in the, in the Old Testament. Lamech in Genesis chapter 4, taking two wives for himself rather than one. And Lamech exercising vengeance, vengeance only belonging to the Lord. Um, Israelites rejected God as ruler over them and subjected themselves to the tyrant Saul, despite all that God said it would cost them. Uh, from Adam to Lamech, to Saul, to the Assyrians, to the Babylonians, to the Persians, to the Greeks, to the Romans, uh, to the Pharisees in the Lord's day, and to leaders just like them in our own day. Uh, we hear all the time, don't we, uh, law for thee and not for me. <laughs> law for thee and not for me. We see that kind of tyranny all over the place. Let me give you an example from uh, the Lord's day, uh, Matthew chapter 23. Turn there with me. Matthew chapter 23. And before we begin to look at this more particularly with respect to relationship between church and state, I want you to see just an example of this from the Pharisees, uh, beginning in Matthew 23, verse 1. In Matthew chapter 23, the Lord Jesus Christ is in a scathing confrontation with the Pharisees. And he begins in verse 1. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, 
the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. In other words, the scribes and the Pharisees have an authority. They sit in Moses' seat. So whatever the scribes and Pharisees tell you from the seat of Moses, whatever they glean from the law of Moses, expounding or expositing the law of Moses, from the teaching of Moses, the Lord says, that observe and do. Right? They are teaching from the seat of Moses. Uh, they're exp expounding Moses, expositing Mo Moses uh, for the people. And the Lord says they have authority in that as much in as much as they speak from the seat of Moses and so because it's Moses the Lord says observe do what they uh, observe what they tell you to do right but that is the extent of their authority verses one through three whatever Moses says would be good for you to understand and obey that's what you're to do but he says verse three do not do according to their works particularly there what the Lord has in mind is their tradition okay do not do according to their traditions why because they say and do not do, right? So what are their works then that the people should avoid doing? Verse three, what is it that is sinful and wicked about their leadership from the seed of Moses? It's not what Moses is saying, right? It's not the word of God and it's not their, the authority that they're exercising to command the people from the seat of Moses. What is it that's sinful or wicked? They say, they command, and they do not do. They make burdensome and authoritarian rules that they themselves do not obey. I want you to think with me about that for a moment. Verse four, right? They bind heavy burdens hard to bear. Those heavy burdens are bound with their heartless and ritualistic traditions, the commandments of men. And they lay them on men's shoulders, verse 4, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, right? In other words, there is a limit to their authority, and the scribes and Pharisees have gone beyond it, okay? Scribes and Pharisees have exceeded the limits on their authority. They bind abusive burdens that go beyond the proper application of the law of Moses, they show absolutely no sympathy, no love. In other words, they won't help. They won't, uh, what does the Lord say? They will not move them with one of their fingers. They're not going to help in the slightest. What does that sound like? It sounds like tyranny, doesn't it? And it meets the three-part criteria for tyranny that we've already discussed. It goes beyond biblical law. It goes beyond biblical limitations, right? And it goes beyond the bounds of biblical love. Uh, they are abusive in their exercise of authority. And so their tyrannical authoritarianism then is exposed by their hypocrisy, right? They say, and they do not do. They bind heavy burdens that they themselves can't bear and they won't lift one finger to move it, okay? Uh, closing down hair salons and then going to one to get your due done. Right. <laughs> getting caught on video visiting a hair salon after you closed all the hair salons in the state, right? Closing down churches while supporting public riots. Closing down churches while you leave bars open, right? When the Lord says that they say and do not do, he's saying this about men who are obsessed with religious observance, right? Obsessed with the law. He is talking about those who um, were keeping every fine point of their religious tradition. So what he doesn't mean is that they say and not do. He doesn't mean that they're not outwardly or externally keeping the law. They meticulously um, were, they were meticulously faithful to keep external conformity to the law. So what does he mean here? He means it's not from the heart. And Lord rebukes the Pharisees for this uh, on a regular basis. They don't actually believe what they're peddling, right? They're not obeying the law from the heart. He routinely rebuked the Pharisees for missing the heart of the law. Uh, they didn't obey from the heart, and so they were hypocrites. Um, there's a place in, um, I believe it's in, uh, well, in Mark chapter 7, but I think it's in, in um, Luke chapter 11, uh, where the Lord calls the multitudes to himself, and he says to the multitudes of come. To, that come to him, listen, what goes into a man does not defile him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him, basically undermining what the Pharisees have been teaching by their tradition. Uh, the Lord Je Jesus Christ does that in Mark chapter seven. 
uh, same kind of uh, teaching. Uh, they're hypocritical in their application of the law. They're obeying it um, in external moralism or external formalism. They're not obeying from the heart. So what's the real reason then for this overreach? Overreach of their authority, the, the rise of their tyranny, you could say, in Matthew ch chapter 23, what's the reason that, that the Lord gives for this? Uh, they want power and influence over the lives of the people. We see that in verse 5. But all their works they do to be seen by men. Scrambling to find your mask a minute before you're about to go on TV when you've been walking around in public outside without it. <laughs> but you're about to go on TV, so I've got to have my mask, right? Um, they do all their works to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. Sounds like our modern day politician. What does the Lord do then in response to this tyranny? We're going to talk about this text in particular uh, in the future. But what does the Lord do here in response? He practices and encourages others to practice what we might consider or call Christian resistance. He says, don't do what they do. Uh, don't pay attention to their man-made traditions. That's the emphasis of Mark chapter 7, right? They set aside the commandment of God and place uh, there in the stead of the commandments of God, the doctrines or traditions of men. Uh, you're not to do what they do. He and his disciples pick heads of grain on the Sabbath in violation of Pharisaical law. They eat those heads of grain with unwashed hands. Why do you and your disciples violate the law and eat with unwashed hands, right? Um, the Lord Jesus Christ heals on the Sabbath. If you remember, um, I want to say it's in John chapter 7, when the Lord heals the man uh, by the pool at Bethesda. He tells him to rise, take up his mat, and walk. The Pharisees find him walking around with his mat, and they excoriate him because he's doing something that is unlawful on the Sabbath. It was something that the Lord Jesus Christ told him to do. In Mark chapter 7, the Lord calls the multitude together after one of these incidents uh, and teaches against their traditions, against their Pharisaical laws. This is an example, if you will, of Christian resistance to tyranny. The scribes and Pharisees, leaders of the people, here in this case, have gone beyond their proper jurisdiction and are now binding men's consciences, binding the conscience of the individual um, outside the parameters of God's law, which is not what the state, government, leaders, families, pastors, fathers, it's not what we're to do. We're not to compel or bind men's consciences outside the parameters of biblical law. In doing that, they've become tyrants. And the Lord meets that tyranny with the law of God and proper resistance. I would submit to you as we move forward in this study and we get to the point of application, that's what we're going to discuss. Um, we're going to discuss the Lord's response to this uh, and moving forward um, by applying biblical law, biblical parameters, and a healthy theology of Christian resistance. I would submit to you that when it comes to our government, um, professing Christians have done a very, very, very poor job of that over decades now, over decades. Um, poor job of following the Lord's example in this. Um, our government... And I think this is an important point uh, to think about. Our government is no less accountable to the law of God than the Pharisees were in the Lord's day. No less accountable to the law of God. No less accountable to obey God, to be God's minister for good. Apart from that law, we, our government in particular, has no objective moral basis for any law. Uh, and we're going to see a a fairly rapid deterioration in the laws that this country passes. They're going to be passing laws uh, with respect to the will of the individual or the, the will of the mob, for example. Uh, we're going to talk about democracy uh, soon. Um, our founding fathers, there were, there were multiple uh, throughout our history that did not believe democracy was a good idea. That's why we're a republic is because democracy devolves into mob rule and morality then is determined by mob vote. And we're going to see that in short order. We're already seeing that, you know, based on the, the preferences or the, um, the supposed 
morality of secular humanism, Roman first and his buddies. Uh, we've seen laws passed with respect to divorce, laws passed with respect to abortion, laws passed with respect to marriage, and that's going to continue to be the case. We already see that in other countries with respect to uh, a freedom of speech. Here recently, there was a pastor who was arrested in, uh, on a street corner in London, open-air preaching, mentioned homosexuality. He was arrested. Uh, arrests, um, apparently, fairly numerous now in Canada. So it's uh, coming to a neighborhood near you. Um, when our government violates the boundaries of its proper jurisdiction, what should we do? We should do what the Lord does, rebuke and resist, right? We'll talk about that. What has undermined this proper response in part, or maybe what began to undermine um, the church's response to tyranny in our recent past has been a misunderstanding of the separation of church and state. Uh, church and state, a, a misunderstanding of the separation between church and state is one spoke, if you will, on a wheel of problems that have led to uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But this was a big one, and I want to introduce it to you this morning. We'll talk about it more as in the coming weeks. Uh, we've come to think, many professing Christians have come to think, that the government is entitled to act without responsibility to the law of God. That somehow because there is this uh, separation between church and, state, church and state, that the government is entitled to act autonomously from the law of God, is entitled to act without responsibility or accountability to God. And secondly, that Christians then are out of bounds to insist that the law of God should be considered. Now we're very, very, very late in coming to that party and the damage that has been done, I personally uh, see as irreparable, but it does not negate our responsibility as the church uh, to address the state with the law of God and insist that the law of God be um, observed or that the principles contained in the law of God uh, be the basis for our mor morality. I think the church in being a, um, a voice with the gospel to this culture needs to insist on that. And we have to fulfill our responsibility in our generation to that end, uh, even though um, ground has already been given up in large part uh, to the enemy in that. Uh, the professing church today is uh, modern day Eli. Uh, we don't restrain anything, right? The professing church doesn't even restrain sin within its own ranks. Uh, you talk to 99% of pastors or church members professing Christians in our country today, and they've never even heard of church discipline. They have no earthly idea. And those are texts in the Bible that deal specifically with that. They've never even heard of the concept before, much less actually practice it. Uh, and if it can't, if the church won't restrain sin within its own ranks, it certainly can't restrain anything outside of its own ranks. Most professing Christians are complicit in the very sins they are called to restrain. In other words, uh, if you talk to, um, for example, uh, the folks from here that go out to witness, preach the gospel at the abortion mill, uh, how many times, brothers and sisters that go out there, how many times do you speak to a professing Christian, right, who is uh, asking the Lord for forgiveness as they go in to murder their baby, right? Um, that, that's a routine a routine experience on the part of those who are witnessing. We run into professing Christians on a regular basis who are complicit in the very sins that the church is called to restrain. Not only approving of those who practice such things, Romans chapter 1, verse 32, but doing the very same things themselves under the judgment of God. A right understanding of the separation of church and state will help us to better understand our responsibility to and for the state. In other words, we need to have it clear in our head. Even if the, the state misinterprets or misunderstands that, which the state inevitably always does, uh, you and I, we need to have our minds wrapped around that. We need to be thinking clearly about it so that we can understand our responsibility to and for the state. Amen. There is an overlap in jurisdictions or spheres. Uh, I think beginning next week, we're going to look at um, Abraham Kuyper's uh, sphere sovereignty, which I think will be really helpful. Uh, but there is an overlap between these various spheres. And that's because we're all applying principles from God's word, and it provides a helpful system of checks and balances. The church is to be a helpful check and balance to the power of the state. Uh, the state is to be a checks and balances against uh, the tyrannical rule, for example, of a father. 
uh, or even a church, right? They're a, they're a helpful system of checks and balances. But what's happened in our country is a, an entirely successful effort to entirely separate the influence of the church from the operation and affairs of the state. Um, there's been a wall that's been built. The state continues to per- pursue control or jurisdiction over the church to some increasing degree, but the church is to have absolutely no influence whatsoever over the state. So the, the state, like, um, again, a power-hungry Leviathan, continues to encroach upon the spheres um, that it's not, has no authority to in, intrude upon, continues to encroach upon those spheres and has um, effectively um, blocked uh, any influence whatsoever from the, the church. This successful, very successful effort has been won by very aggressive secularists, proponents of the new religion that we've been talking about in weeks past. And that's been won, that victory has been won over a very sluggardly uh, and feckless Uh, professing but apostate church, and that's the church in our country uh, today, Um, cowardly, inept, impotent, feckless, sluggardly, Uh, if it can't rouse up enough indignation over the murder of 60 million babies, uh, has no hope of arousing any kind of indignation over anything. (laughs) And that's what we see largely in the church today in our country. And that kind of church you find on virtually every corner in town. That effort won by secularists has been largely won in the courts. And that in the courts through a misrepresentation or a misapplication of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution with regards to the separation of church and state. In um, conceiving of the First Amendment, our founders had in mind countries and peoples ruled by monarchs who used official state churches to wield a tyrannical or authoritarian control over the people they governed, right? So you imagine when the, um, when the Puritans, uh, the Huguenots uh, began to come to the United States, uh, coming here for religious freedom. They're coming from countries where the state used the power of the church to wield an authoritarian control over the people. And they did so by establishing state churches of which the monarch became the head. And there was this divine right of kings, right? That God had given authority to the king uh, over the affairs of state and no one could question his authority. So the founders, in thinking of that, when they came to our country and began to uh, conceive of uh, the government that we're now under, the founders then intended the first amendment to protect churches, protect churches from that, from the encroachment of the federal government, particularly the Congress, in setting up a state religion um, that would encroach upon the sphere sovereignty of the church. James Madison said this, the people feared that one religious sect might obtain preeminence or two combined together and establish a religion of the state to which they would compel other religions to conform. And that's exactly what we see in Europe uh, in the rule of English kings, for example. Um, uh, uh, Protestant would come in and the country would turn Protestant, um, would revert to the the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. A Catholic would come in. All the Protestants would be driven out. Protestant pastors would be murdered. And Catholicism would be instituted as a state religion, right? And then that queen would be dethroned and the next Protestant would come in. Uh, the founding fathers were only too familiar with this uh, form of tyranny. And so conceived of our first amendment uh, to protect the right, not of the government, but to the protect the right of churches to act within their own sphere uh, autonomously from encroachment by the state. It was never meant to sequester government from the influence of the church. That was never the intention of the first uh, amendment. Supreme Court, Court Justice uh, Joseph Story, who was uh, late 1700s, any attempt to level all religions and to make it a matter of state policy to hold all religions in utter indifference would have created universal disapprobation, strong disapproval, if not universal indignation. In other words, what um, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story is saying is that uh, if our government intended through the First Amendment 
to say that in our country, all religions, whether it was Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc., that all of those were completely level and that one, in particular Christianity, did not have a preference in our country or that it was to um, hold all religions in utter indifference. In other words, um, uh, did not uh, bear a preference to our Christian founding. He said that would have created universal disapprobation, a strong disapproval on the part of the public, if not universal indignation. In other words, the people would not have stood for it. Right? They would not have stood for it. Uh, this was founded on Christian principles. Our country is founded on uh, God's law. The intent of the First Amendment was to prevent, this is again Joseph's story, was to prevent any national ecclesiastical or church establishment which should give to a hierarchy the exclusive patronage of the national government. There was not to be any national government church. There was not to be a state church. You guys have heard, um, in particular recently, I'm sure, with the uh, maybe the death of Prince Philip in the news, uh, you've heard of the Anglican church the state church of England. Uh, who is the head of the state church of England? The queen. <laughs> Does the queen belong over the church in any form <laughs> or capacity? No. Right? So that's one of the things that the, the founding fathers were attempting to avoid through the first amendment. In fact, the language, that language, separation of church and state, does not appear anywhere in our Constitution or in the First Amendment. doesn't appear anywhere. The law, it's contained in what's called the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. The Establishment Clause of our Constitution, the First Amendment, says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. They can't form a state-run church, a government-run church, nor can they prohibit the free exercise thereof. They can't get in the business prohibiting or restricting, encroaching upon the free exercise of religion on the part of any church in our country. That's the establishment clause of the First Amendment. So where then does the language separation of church and state come from? Um, it's been used, that language has been used in court cases over decades um, to effectively um, take any religious influence whatsoever out of the schools. Never mind religious influence. Um, you can't pray. Like you, you, th there's been uh, fights about football coaches saying the Lord's Prayer with the team before or after a football game, right? Um, you can't do that. There have been um, students only, no teachers, no faculty, students only wanting to, you know, gather around the flag. There's one day a year, I can't remember what that day is called. Um, one day a year, they gather around the flag to pray. That's been nixed, canceled in most, uh, most schools. Um, can't bring a Bible or open a Bible uh, in most classrooms. You can't wear a t-shirt with any kind of religious statement on it. In other words, the state has done a very, very, the ACLU groups like them, done a very, very, very effective job of eradicating any influence, any presence at all of the church um, in public schools, for example. That has been done in the courts on the back of this very statement, uh, clause, the separation of church and state. So where does that language come from? Come from? Well, it comes from a letter, a personal letter, that Thomas Jefferson wrote to uh, the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. The Danbury Baptist Association wrote to Jefferson, who was president at the time, uh, complaining that under current law, or the way that the First Amendment was currently worded, that the language of our founding documents, in particular the Declaration of Independence, um, appears to communicate that rights, the rights that we have are given by the state. And the Danbury Baptist Association, Baptists have always believed in a jurisdiction, a jurisdictional division between church and state. Danbury Baptist Association uh, wanted Jefferson to consider 
amending the language to make it clear that our right, rights are given to us by God and not by the state. It was language that wasn't uh, overly clear in the way the documents were originally written. Jefferson, in his reply to the Danbury Baptist Association, um, makes a comment about a wall, building a wall of separation between church and state. In other words, wanting to encourage the Baptists in the free exercise of their religion and guaranteeing to them no encroachment by the state by saying that there has been built, in the language of the Constitution, there's been built a wall of separation between church and state. And that was, uh, again, a private letter from the Danbury Baptist Association to Jefferson, and then Jefferson's reply to that association. Jefferson was not a part of the group, uh, the Congress, the Constitutional Congress in 1787 that, that, that formed or wrote the First Amendment. He was not a part of the Congress that passed the Bill of Rights, and yet that letter of Jefferson has been used to argue Bill of Rights cases and First Amendment cases for decades since. Um, upholding what Jefferson called a wall of separation. Now, that statement argued in virtually every case involving prayer in schools, religious, religious meetings on school grounds, um, now the, the hanging of the Ten Commandments in courthouses, prayer before sessions of Congress, um, it continues to be argued in virtually every um, religious liberties case that goes before the court. So what is the biblical and therefore the correct way to see a separation of jurisdiction between civil and ecclesiastical boundaries? Where do we go to get a right view of that? We go to the Bible, right? Go to the Bible. And in the Bible, there are multiple examples of this. Multiple examples of what the Bible upholds as a proper separation of church and state. Proper jurisdictional boundaries or jurisdictional roles of the state as compared to uh, the church. A couple of those uh, examples up front, uh, we see, for starters, in Israel, throughout the Old Testament, we see a jurisdictional division between church and state in the affairs of Israel, the nation of Israel. Uh, you have uh, Moses, Moses appointing the 70 elders, Moses appointing um, leaders over thousands and leaders over hundreds and leaders over fifties, right? So Moses and the leaders... Um, given jurisdiction over the civil affairs of the state, but who had ecclesiastical authority for the state? Who was over the church, if you will, in the nation of Israel? Aaron, a high priest. And who did Aaron have working for him? Moses had the leaders, had the elders. Aaron had the Levites, right? So they were over the, there was a, a jurisdictional separation between civil and ecclesiastical responsibilities. Uh, you see that persist throughout the Old Testament, the kings and the priests in the Old Testament. For example, a king, uh, Saul, and Samuel. You remember that story from uh, 1 Samuel where um, uh, Samuel delays his coming? And what does Saul do in violation of the law? He sacrifices the burnt offering, right? He sacrifices the burnt offering because he was tired of waiting on Samuel. Samuel's delayed his coming. What did Saul do? Saul violated his jurisdiction. He had no authority, no authority to offer sacrifices of burnt offering before the Lord. Samuel was the one that was to do that. Saul overstepped his bounds. You see that with um, David and Nathan in a different way. King David, but who comes to David to rebuke David for his unrepentant sin with Bathsheba and killing Uriah the Hittite. Nathan, right? You have David, who is uh, given authority over the civil affairs of state. Nathan, the high priest at the time, uh, the prophet, um, given ecclesiastical authority to confront David in his sin, okay? So we see that in multiple cases in the Old Testament. It's throughout the Old Testament, right? We see overlap. And we see influence. For example, in the, in the case of um, David and Nathan, you see influence, you see overlap, but there is a clear jurisdictional separation. Uh, Dr. DeMar, again, we would not agree with uh, Dr. DeMar's theonomy, but we would agree with much of what he says here. says, there was never such a separation between church and state that the state was free from following the guidelines of scripture for its civil duties. Um, 
the state was to submit itself to the word of God. In fact, in, um, it's, in, um, it's in Deuteronomy 17, where kings who are given, again, authority over the state, kings are required of God to write their own personal copy of the law of God, and kings were to see to it that they and their government and their people obeyed the law of God. They were to keep the law of God with them at all times. Um, so priests and kings were, requi were required to um, go to the law to be instructed. Let me give you an example of this, uh, a usurpation or a tyrannical um, overreach of this authority or this jurisdiction in 2 Chronicles. Turn to 2 Chronicles with me. Let's look at an example. We'll uh, conclude with this and then I'll um, maybe give you a few minutes here to ask questions. I've been rambling for a while, so hopefully I can... Uh, give you a few minutes to ask questions. Second Chronicles chapter 26. In chapter 26, we have the example of King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a good king, but then uh, overstepped his bounds uh, late in his reign. We see that in verse uh, 16. Verse 16, right? Just one example of authoritarian or tyrannical overreach by a king in Israel, king having jurisdiction over the civil affairs of state, where the high priest, or the Levites, had jurisdiction over the ecclesiastical affairs of state. Look at verse 16. When he was strong, when Uzziah was strong in his heart, he was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by uh, entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Okay? So we see the problem, right? The king didn't have authority to do that. Only the priest could do that. Verse 17. So that was a jurisdictional overreach. He exercised an authority um, in an arbitrary, unlimited, or abusive way by pouring over, uh, overflowing the banks, if you will, of his jurisdiction. Verse 17. So Azariah, the priest, went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, the men who were prepared to fight, right? Verse 18. They, they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Now, wait a minute. I thought we were to obey the governing authorities, that all of these authorities were appointed by God, and that we're to obey the governing authorities. Who do these priests think they are standing up to the king in this way? You see the, the difficulty, right? Um, Uzziah has transgressed the law of God by operating outside of his jurisdiction. Verse 19, then Uzziah became furious, which is oftentimes what kings do, right? In their tyranny. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. God affirmed uh, the boundaries here. Verse 20, And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. In other words, he lost or he forfeited the authority with which he governed. He lost the consent from God with which he governed. Uh, and in his tyranny was not to be obeyed in that sense. He was cast out. He was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. The rest of the acts of Uzziah from the first to the last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote. Uzziah rested with his fathers. All right, so just an example. One of many, many, many examples in the Old Testament. And as we'll see uh, in coming weeks when we uh, start going through New Testament texts, uh, there are many, many examples of this in the, in the New Testament as well. Uh, suffice to say for now, in, in terms of an introduction to uh, separation of church and state, that we're given as the church, as the family, as the government, um, as the individual, we're given jurisdictional boundaries. 
And one sphere is not to encroach upon in an authoritarian way, uh, not to encroach upon the sphere of another. When, and in particular government, generally the one who um, uh, likes to do this, when governments begin to exercise authority outside the parameters or limitations of God's law, outside the parameters or, um, thank you, brother, um, biblical limitations or outside the parameters of biblical love, then the state is um, abusive or wielding its authority in an unrestrained um, or unlimited way. And that's the very definition of tyranny, right? And we as Christians then uh, need to address the state in their overreach. And we'll talk about how that's done in the future. All right, with the few minutes remaining, um, let me give you an opportunity to ask questions if you have any. Please forgive me for continuing to ramble. Tyler. Thanks, Lee. Hopefully that, these things will become more clear as we keep going forward. So as I understand it in um, 2 Chronicles 26, what, what you're saying is, in these other examples, um, 1 Samuel 15, um, you're drawing a comparison or a parallel between Old Testament Israel's division of civil law and Levitical law, you're drawing that comparison today with the separation of church and state. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good point too, um, thinking about that brother that, um, so we'll, we'll talk about this subject more in detail in the future also, but a theonomist, someone who would hold to theonomy would say that the civil and judicial laws of Israel should be applied to governments, um, Gentile, thank you, brother, essentially Gentile governments uh, outside the church today. And we would disagree with that. So where, where we would see um, those Old Testament examples are as illustrations of government overreach in our own day, but not as prescriptions for how our government is to operate. In other words, uh, there are those who would say that our government today uh, should operate according to biblical law that if someone commits adultery, they should be put to death, right? If uh, um, a woman is thought to be an adultery, we should make her drink bitter water and determine right, whether she gets a swell, swollen stomach that she's uh, guilty or not guilty. There are theonomists who believe in a, um, a practical application of Old Testament theocratic, the civil and judicial law of Israel, that law should be applied uh, to the state, Gentile states today. We would strongly disagree with that. Uh, but I think the illustration is valid that there's um, uh, an over overreach on the part of the judicial or civil branch into the ecclesiastical branch and then how the ecclesiastical branch um, responded. And that jurisdictional separation is established in the Bible. And that's the basis of a separation between church and state. By the time uh, the founders or the Puritans got to the colonies, that jurisdictional separation was already established. It wasn't established in the first amendment. It was established by the letter from Thomas Jefferson. The, the separation was already established by Bible believing Christians who knew the word of God before that. Um, it was abused by the courts after Jefferson wrote the letter, but not established um, by the courts or established by our country. Last question, and we can keep going. Yes, hey brother, nice haircut. <laughs> Did Ralphie do that to you? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so my question, it, it comes from, uh, just based on this, this has been amazing, help me understand, because I actually, I have an ex-roommate, if that's a thing, um, that, what just, was just adamant about the separation of church and state, just mm -hmm. build that wall, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but based off of everything that I've just, um, I've been, I've been hearing, it seems that only the state has been encroaching on the church and the state has been trying to seek its Leviathanical tentacles into <laughs> the, the power of the church to control it. But I guess my question is, how is it that people can see, um, the church, controlling the state or, or building the wall thinking that the church is encroaching our rights or like how can they sit there and, and try to um, squash more of the power of the church thinking the church is being over like authoritarian? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if the state had no uh, double standard, it'd have no standard at all. So uh, there, there's, there's a double standard at work there. Um, yeah, the, the, the courts have been very successful in keeping out any influence on the part of the church at all. 
So our authority, the church's authority, is, an, is a, um, a declarative authority. We have a responsibility to declare the word of God, to preach the gospel. And I think uh, in particularly in our day and age, and really what uh, the church has largely done, the professing church, I have to make that clarification. What the professing church has done today is um, really uh, abandon its declarative role by um, monasticizing itself. Um, clustering itself within the four walls of the church uh, rather than preaching uh, to the culture of the gospel. And you see examples of that in the New Testament with, um, for example, John the Baptist lost his head for it, um, but um, wasn't going to let Herod uh, get away with it without a word from God, right? And I think the church needs to have that attitude today um, that we need to stand up for God's word and not just let wickedness run amok without um, a word from God um, to that. And um, so uh, as for us, brothers and sisters, we're going to have to consider it, consider how it is that we're going to do our part uh, in that, uh, to be faithful. And um, I think it'll become more clear to us as we continue working, working through the series. So thanks for the questions. All right, let's pray and we'll prepare for worship. Father in heaven, uh, thank you again for your instruction uh, on this, for how clear your word is on this. And Help us to apply your word biblically, faithfully, uh, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom and his rightful rule and reign as king. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, much fruit for our labor. And as we uh, follow you faithfully in proclaiming the gospel to this lost generation, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us uh, much favor uh, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, much fruit uh, for our effort, uh, for the sake of his kingdom. Sinners would be saved, and that, Lord, if you would allow, that we might even experience um, an awakening, a great awakening here in this generation, uh, maybe a return of um, righteousness, of some holiness, Lord, before uh, the end, should you determine to return. And um, ask you, Lord, that um, you might, uh, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the for His glory, um, for the sake of the gospel, uh, would bear fruit to that end. We love you. We thank you for this. Thank you for this uh, precious church and these brothers and sisters. And pray, Lord, uh, that you'd help us as we consider our part in all of this. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.